Any questions? Uh, no lab report for 17 and 18. That's true. But you do have lab report for 19. You have three lab reports for 19 because we are doing three separate experiments for 19. Any other questions? Sure. Okay. Um, IR. Let me see if I can do that. The IR spectroscopy or infrared spectroscopy, in general, a spectroscopy technique, one of the major components for the, uh, for the spectroscopy technique is the uh, light source, right? So you have the uh, light source or the source of the energy. Um, then you have, uh, so you have the light source. Then you have your sample holder. Then you have your detector. And you have your recorder. Now, when it comes to IR, the light source, the, energy, the amount of energy that is provided for this spectroscopy technique is uh, low energy. And uh, the light that is used is within the IR region. So from 400 to uh, 4,000 um, per centimeter, that's the wave number uh, that is used for the scale. So if you have the uh, 400 and then 4,000, that's per centimeter. That's the energy source that is used for, the, for IR. The sample holder, you have seen me uh, performing IR at least once in the, in the uh, instrument room. It takes very small sample. Um, traditionally, they were making mixing the sample with the KBR or um, NACL pellets. And they were making very thin layer using very high pressure to make a thin layer pellet. And then they were placing that in the where the light would shine through. But the new ones, uh, the new sample holders, they actually have two pieces of uh, diamond that you place a small piece of sample and you just screw the top. It will um, make it very thin, but very small uh, piece of the crystal, uh, change it to very thin layer, and then the light would shine through. When the light shines through the sample, your detector is going to detect how your sample respond to the light. So the amount of the light that is, is shining through the um, sample in IR machine or IR instrument is just enough to vibrate the bond, to stretch the bond. It's not enough to break the bond. So the bond is not broken. Um, so what happens when you have like a, you have a bond, let's say you have this bond, uh, when the light goes through, if it does a stretch, it will go through like it would get longer. The bond length gets longer. So you have this change in, this is like very just showing the significance of it, but the bond length is going to change. So it goes from D1 to D2. When this happens, dipole moment for that bond is going to change how do you calculate dipole moment what is dipole moment dipole moment it's mu that's the sign and is read as mu equals d times sigma or delta this delta represents change in electronegativity and this is the distance the bond length now, what this detector is detecting here, or supposed to detect, is going to, um, is going to look at the sample, how it's responding, uh, at what region the light is absorbed, and the uh, dipole moment has changed. 
based on the change in dipole moment when the light is absorbed is going to show you signal if it shows that there was a light absorption at 3300 it would give you a signal like this if you have a absorption of the light around 1700 it would show a peak but detector is going to detect at what region the light has been absorbed and absorption of the light is to stretch the uh, the bond length and the bond length that is stretched here is going to cause change in dipole moment so basically change in mu is detected by the detector in IR system different system different spectroscopy system they would have different um, character to measure but for the uh, for IR this detector is going to to measure how much energy has been used or in what region has been uh, light has been absorbed to change the dipole moment if so that brings another um, idea of your molecule if if your molecule is 100% symmetrical and nonpolar it doesn't matter how much you change the d the value for d if it's changed you can change the value of D, you can put a lot of energy, you can increase this value, so the D can change, but this delta is not going to change because there is no uh, change in electronegativity here. The value for delta is zero, and it's zero, it doesn't matter what is the value of D, any value of D times zero is going to give you mu of zero, and is going from zero to zero, there is no change. So if you have a bond that is going to be um, is going to show no signal in IR, that type of bond is called IR inactive bond. What type of bonds are inactive in IR system? Those are the bonds that they are um, nonpolar and they are perfectly symmetrical, like the this um, internal alkyne. If you have exact two alkyl group, same alkyl group on each side of the carbon-carbon triple bond, you're not going to see signal for triple bond here. But if you have if you have a different compound going from the 400 to uh, 4,000, where would you see the the signals? Those signals, you would see signal for CC single bond around 1200. You would see CC, this is about 1200, CC double bond around 1600. You would see CC triple bond around 2200. What this pattern is showing us, the stronger the bond, more energy is needed to change the bond length and that makes sense right so if you have a single bond double bond triple bond the number or the per centimeter or the wave number is going to increase that's one pattern that you need to know if you have CO single bond that's going to happen the bond for this one the, the signal for CO single bond is going to be around and these are not exact numbers so you might see different number in lab manual you see different number in the table in your lecture book used for lecture or online but that's why I put this tilde sign here that means that it's approximate number for CO but the pattern always is true and the region is going to be still the same CO double bond is going to have a peak around 1700 so double bond is greater than uh, single bond so the wave number for double bond is greater than single bond if you have a CH attached to carbon that is sp3 can you tell me what's the region for the CH uh, sp3 CH if this CH is coming from carbon that is sp2 if you have a CH that is coming from SP hybrid, uh, look at your response. Below 3000, okay, very good. So this is going to be 
um, less than 3,000. Around 2,900 to 3,000, right? 2,900 to 3,000. For SP2, for SP2 is going to be 3,000 to 3,100. And then for SP is going to be at 3,300. So the more S character, the stronger the bond. That also follows the, exact, the pattern. The stronger the bond, the higher energy, amount of energy is needed to, to um, vibrate or to increase the bond length. So you have another pattern that is going to help you to memorize these numbers easier and, uh, and better at, as long as you have these, these patterns. Some numbers are kind of repeated. So if you have a number that is repeated 3300 here, we had a um, 3300 for the OH, and we have 3300 for NH. How do we recognize, is it going to be OH, CH, or is it going to be NH? Then you have to look for the very good for the shape of the for the shape of the peak. So if you have a peak at 3300 that is going to be broad with a round tip, that is OH. If you have a peak at 3300 with a spike, 3300 with one spike, this is going to be um, an H that is a secondary amine. If you have a peak at 3300 with more than one spike, that is going to be NH2 and that is a primary amine. So you look at the two spikes and that is a primary amine because we have two hydrogens here. So it's going to show you two spikes. So based on the based on the shape of the peak, you can recognize what type of uh, bond you have in the molecule. IR is very strong in function, determining functional group. And then for the CH that is coming from um, SP hybrid, this is going to be CH from SP hybrid carbon. That is a sharp peak, is a short peak, is not broad, is a short and is very uh, sharp peak in the, same, um, in the same region. So since these numbers are constant, so if you have a compound today that is going to show a peak at 3300, broad peak, you know, is alcohol. That alcohol, if you, same alcohol, if you test it for 40 more times, it's going to show the same peak in the same region. Now, if you have an unknown, in the in the lab when you have an unknown you are going to use the um, the unknown take the spectrum at least you could say if your unknown has uh, oh functional group or it doesn't have oh functional group you have nh or if you have nh2 or if you have a a um, ch for the co double bond since we talked about the co double bond also in in lab the other day uh, for CO double bond, there are a couple factors that is going to affect the location of CO double bond. Now, if your CO double bond is aldehyde for H, you are going to have a set of numbers. So you would have around 1700, 2700, and 2800. You have three of them. If it's a ketone, If it's a ketone, you would have peak at 1700. If it's ester, that number is going to change because you have electron with another electron withdrawing group here. Uh, this number for CO is going to change to 1730 to 1740. But if the CO double bond is conjugated, if it's attached to a benzene ring that is conjugated, this number is going to drop to 1680. 
the spectrum that I sent you last class for dibenzyl acetone, that was super conjugated. And do you remember what was the number? Did you open that file already? No, I said in the lab that it's going to be less than 1700. But when I did the IR, it was actually, this number was much lower. It was a 1649. A 1649, a huge, significant drop is because of super conjugation of the CO double bond between the two side of the, of the molecule. So super conjugation. So conjugation lowers the wave number and electron withdrawing group is going to increase the um, the wave number compared to comparing to the base that we have for ketone or we have for uh, for aldehyde. So what we are using the the IR in the lab for two fun two different purposes. One is to monitor the reaction if the reaction is complete is not complete. Second is to identify unknown. So if our unknown is pure sample and we take the IR spectrum based on the functional group, we can at least determine to which family of the compound the IR uh, belongs to. So is there anything from IR that you want me to explain? Do you need to know the, those numbers? You are going to memorize for your lecture anyway. So that could be one question. And what we use that in the lab for is going to be application of that. So I'm not going to say if you have a carboxyl group, where is the where is the peak? What's the location of the peak? But but I would tell you. Uh, but but I would tell you, oh, it's nice that you have a lecture. You have chart. I I don't give chart to my students, so that's nice. The uh, uh, and at the same time, I don't expect exact numbers. I just know that the I want them to know the approximate numbers. So um, the reaction that you did for for reduction of ketone, how would you use IR to find out? So those are the questions that you will see on the on the exam. Uh, how would you use IR to monitor the reaction? How would you use IR to find that the reaction is the product is pure when you are doing reduction of a ketone experiment? So these are the questions that the type of questions that you would exactly. Um, so these are the type of questions that you would say. So the answer for that question, it would be uh, like a, the appearance of the peak for OH at 3300. So give, you have to give the location. A peak, would, a broad peak would appear at 3300. And then the uh, peak at 1700 should disappear. If the peak at 1700 still is there, that means your compound is still has is contaminated, or some of the reactant still is is left over. So you have uh, we are using the IR and the NMR, the application of these two for for the lab. So I'm not going to pick questions, even though you have as a pre lab, and you have the um, assignments for you to do, but I'm not taking those straight questions like draw the IR spectrum for this compound. You get enough of those questions in lecture. So we only emphasize on application of the IR in the in the lab. Is there any questions from IR that you want me to explain? Is there anything from the IR spectrum that you want me to explain at this point? No? OK. So what, what, we need to, what you need to know is the approximate location. Uh, what is the, the IR based on? Is based on change in dipole moment. The stronger the bond is going to show like um, a stronger peak, um, if the, the more polar bonds. Like when you see a peak for CO double bond that is so strong, is because CO double bond is very um, polar. But if you have a peak like the CH bond, that is not as a strong. It doesn't reach the baseline uh, for it. The, the shape of the OH, because of the hydrogen bonding, the shape of the OH and NH is a broad shape. And so it's a broad peak because of the hydrogen bonding, because all of these, these um, 
uh, OH bonds, they are attached to, together and at the same time is going to absorb more energy and spends more time when it's scanning. So you would get broad peak in there in that region. So the advantage of, of uh, the spectroscopy technique over wet chemical analysis, you have you have experienced it both at this point. Um, with the wet chemical analysis, you use more sample. Experiment 12, just to find out if you have an ortho or para or meta substitution of your chlorotoluene, um, you had to do the oxidation, how long the reflux took place, like one hour of reflux. The sample size that you used was at least one gram or one milliliter of the, of the sample. And uh, it's time consuming. And the same thing you, if you do with the, with you, the same type of experiments, if you do with the spectroscopy techniques, it takes less than a minute to get the spectrum, uh, to look at the spectrum. And the sample size that is used is very tiny. So the idea of this, like, um, and also is non, that, that's what it means, that is non-invasive and is very fast. The uh, disadvantage is that, like, for IR, you cannot determine molecular formula with IR. So a single spectroscopy technique by itself is not going to be sufficient to determine the structure of formula for the molecule. IR very, is very strong with the functional group, or if you have the functional group, you can use it to find the concentration of that, that compound. Like SPECT, um, not the SPECT20, those handheld devices that the police officers are using for roadside um, testing um, is uh, IR based. So what it does actually is going to measure uh, what the peak area. So if the peak area there is small uh, compared to the sample or the the uh, the limit that Florida has for drinking um, or the alcohol blood alcohol concentration is uh, there is a limit for that. So for for Florida is a 0.08 gram per deciliter uh, so that is a very that is the number 0 0.08 so if you have and then the the machine is calibrated uh, to give you in gram per deciliter what is the uh, what is the concentration so what they do just like you know calculating the peak area they find the peak area and then then they translate that to the concentration and based on that you are you either pass the roadside test or you fail and then you be moved to the next step. And um, sometimes the machine is, if it's not calibrated, you can defend, but you have to have a good, you know, attorney uh, or you have to have the information. So like if you, they can take you in and they can, they can actually make you um, do a blood test. And with the blood test, there is really no nothing that you could do. If the blood test comes up, then that means that you like to drink. So uh, Florida is not the place to live. You have to move to California because in California, they have 0.1 tolerance gram per deciliter. So it's like 0 0.02 units higher. So that is the, that's one of the application that it could be used, uh, the IR application that is used to calculate the peak area based on that you can calculate concentration uh, either either move to california or get good attorney or just um, get uber <laughs> one of the three uh, so uh, the uh other um, application again is just the uh, monitoring the chemical um, chemical reactions, and it is non-invasive. I remember the first time that was actually for mass spec, not for IR. Um, I took like seven, eight graduate courses that it was dealing with eight graduate courses that were dealing with mass spec. So learning about mass spec, it's not like um, half a chapter in organic too. You only learn about the name of mass spec. You don't learn much about it. Um, but one of the courses that my professor took us to the mass spec facility, 
He took his bedding band used in the machine to find the elemental analysis because you can actually do that using the um, sample. You can find out what is the what is the uh, percentage percent composition for the for the sample. And then he took out and he said, well, I've been using this for so many times and I'm still married. So that was like a joke, but it's just like other, you know, joke that usually chemists, they have like very dry jokes. And um, if you only, you know, understand it, you might laugh. But uh, sometimes they are so, so applicable or so sensitive that you will remember for a long time. It's been, I don't know exactly how many years, but it's been more than uh, 10 years or 15 years or more that I have been, I, I've actually took that class 15 years ago and I still remember. And what the, did he actually mean by that is like that the wedding band been through the machine like for 20 times already and still is in the same good shape that his wife did not realize and he's still married um, to the same girl. So it's not the uh, same lady, so it's not, she didn't get upset with it. So that what it actually meant that the technique is non-invasive, that, that uh, nothing happened to the, to the, um, to the wedding band. And uh, that means spectroscopy techniques are very, uh, they require very small sample and they are non-invasive. That's another advantage. The other advantage that you experience is the speed. It's very fast and it takes very little sample. Any questions about IR before we move to NMR? Going to look at the NMR. No? Okay. For NMR, the scale is from 0 to 10. So you have 0 to 10. And then out the scale 10 to 12. NMR is a strong spectroscopy technique as well. If there is a peak between 9 and 10, 9 to 10, that means you have aldehyde. If you have a peak between 10 to 12, uh, out to scale, that means you have carboxylic acid. That's a very good process of elimination. So if you have if you have a NMR spectrum and then you have like four or five choices that what to match with one of those compounds, um, these two and then between seven and eight, that means you have aromatic ring. These three are perfect, uh, you know, way of eliminating your choices. So if it's between seven to eight crowded peak, you have um, Aromatic, 9 to 10, you have aldehyde, and 10 to 12, you have carboxylic acid. And if it's a um, CH3 coming from alkane, it's going to be at 0.9. Uh, if it's a CH2 for secondary carbon, it's going to be around 1.2. If it's a CH, it's going to be at 1.4. And uh, what is happening here is that if you have electron withdrawing group attached to it, is going to shift to down or away from the the internal standard of TMS. So TMS is used here for as an internal standard. TMS is for for uh, methyl groups. They are electron donors. Um, they are not moving electrons. So there's a so with the with the uh, TMS appearing, when you have the signal for TMS, it appears at zero as the internal standard. It can show that the machine is working. Electron withdrawing group, like electron um, the shifting. So if you have the shielding effect in the uh, in NMR, the term is slightly different, but it's the same idea is a de-shielding effect. So if you have electron withdrawing group, that is going to de-shield the hydrogen from, so what NMR as a detector, so we can we can still go back to the same four major parts of the, of the machine. You have your light source, you have your sample holder, 
then you have your detector. What is detector detecting here is that uh, is the magnetic field that is created by odd number mass element that your compound has. Your odd number mass, it could be hydrogen, hydrogen one, like if you have a deuterium, is not going to have the signal, it's not going to show the signal. If you have carbon 13, it's going to show the signal. So um, the magnetic field that is created by the hydrogen uh, is going to be, is going to move your hydrogens, they can move in different different directions, and the magnetic field is going to be at different, many different directions, okay? If you place this uh, in external, like a strong magnetic field, then the magnetic field created by the hydrogens uh, all of a sudden is going to align, and when they align, they are going to align uh, with the, external mag magnetic field because that's the one that is more significant and is the one determining which way they should they should go um, so you have by applying external magnetic field you are going to change the magnetic field from the hydrogen from your or odd number it doesn't have to be hydrogen any odd number is going to be like two sets like the alpha and beta or beta and alpha but what we are more concerned about is the difference in this energy then the amount of energy when you actually scan the sample uh, the all the magnetic field is going to go from beta to alpha position and since the energy different there's energy difference here this energy difference is going to be different so look at this is going to be different for that hydrogen compared to this hydrogen So what does machine recognize is the energy that is needed to go from alpha to beta to make it align. Um, then the amount of the energy that is calculated by the detector here is going to correlate. Is it coming from this type of hydrogen or is coming from this hydrogen? So if you have electron withdrawing group, it can de-shield the, de the um, hydrogens. Um, from the electrons. So for the magnetic field to go in is going to be easier, is not, your hydrogen is not shielded. So if you have the most de-shielded hydrogen is going to show at the most, the highest place, which is the 10 to 12. And this hydrogens are not de-shielded because this hydrogens, there is no electron withdrawing group so the electrons are around the nucleus of this, and the nucleus is not reached by this magnetic field. Um, so you have the electrons moving around this hydrogen more than this hydrogen, because pi system here is going to pull electrons away. So there are two, two factors that it can de-shield your hydrogens. One is electron withdrawing group. The other one is the pi system. So if you have a CC double bond, and then you have hydrogen, all of a sudden, this hydrogen is going to show between 5 and 6 versus this hydrogen that it shows at 0.9. So you have a pi system here that is pulling electrons, this pi system here, pulling electrons from the, from the hydrogen or de-shielding it. So the signals, so this energy is being calculated by the detector. Um, so the energy that is the, the energy difference that you have here, because it's different from aromatic hydrogen compared to the um, CH coming from primary carbon, CH coming from secondary carbon, CH is coming from vinylic, is attached to carbon-carbon double bond or carbon-carbon triple bond. Because those energies are different, then the uh, machine can tell you based on the location of the peak or the location of the signal what type of hydrogen you are dealing with your compound does it have aldehyde does it have aromatic does it have vinylic does it have uh, is just a plain alkane or not so location of the peak it gives you one piece of information what type of hydrogen or what is the chemical environment of the hydrogen you are dealing with or what is the uh, 
how shielded or how de-shielded your hydrogen is. It's a small scale between 0 and 10, basically, because carboxylic acid 10 to 12 is very obvious. And between 9 and 10 is aldehyde. So basically, between 0 and 9, you have to be worried about. And you take out 7 to 8 also for aromatic and 5 to 6 for vinylic hydrogens. So it's not a lot to memorize it. But it's a lot of information that you can you can get from the NMR um, spectrum. So one of the information that you could get from NMR spectrum is how many different type of hydrogens you have. So if you have a CA3 uh, OH, you have two different type of hydrogens. So you have A and you have B type of hydrogen. So for this one, you are going to get one peak for TMS, and then you get the hydrogen A which appears between 2 to 5, and then this hydrogen B. Hydrogen B, if it's attached to oxygen, this carbon attached directly to oxygen, this is going to be de-shielded. So it's not going to appear at uh, 0.9. And this is going to shift to, is it 4.5? Is a number that is going to be de-shielded. So it's going to appear at a... Um, like a 3.5 okay so you would get like one at 3.5 and then you would get one uh, so this signal would be for ch3 for b and then for a is going to be short and broad peak uh, for a this could be this could vary it could go anywhere between two to five so you get only two signals number of signal it shows how many type of uh, hydrogens you have. So how many signals would you get for cyclohexane? How many hydrogens do you have? You have 12 hydrogen, but how many type of hydrogens? One, one type of hydrogen. So you would get only one signal and that one signal it shows that all the hydrogens are the same and you can use it for like pattern uh, you can use the nmr for patterns like you have a um, ch3 here ch3 and one h here this group is like isopropyl because it's isopropyl you have a six to one ratio so if you see and other information that you could get is like a splitting pattern also. Um, you have hydrogens that are A, and this is hydrogen B. Your hydrogen B is going to be splitted by six other hydrogen. So with the N plus 1, uh, with the N plus 1, let's say if this is ring that we are not getting any hydrogen from this side, because if you get from this side, you will also get, it would get split from here also. N plus 1. So it would be um, seven. So it's a short peak. So you would get something like this for the uh, for B hydrogen, and then for A hydrogen, you have six of them. That is going to be a doublet. It's a doublet because you have only one hydrogen on the neighboring carbon. So it would be split by two. So when you get this combination, a uh, short peak, very crowded multiplet. And then you would get like a doublet. Uh, this set, it shows isopropyl. Now, if you have a T-butyl, how is it going to change? If you have a T-butyl attached to another carbon chain, I'm going to, again, use the same example. So with the T-butyl, there is no hydrogen on this carbon, and the hydrogens are A, A, and A. So you have nine hydrogen. And because is there is no hydrogen here, you would get like a very large peak, like a strong peak here, uh, and is a singlet. The splitting pattern, it can help you to identify pattern of the molecule. It's going to help you with the identification of a structure, a structure formula for the molecule. So you can use those patterns also. So we have, we have, the information that we could get, one is the location of the peak that shows the type of hydrogen. The other one is the splitting pattern. So if you have a CH, 
3CH2 CH3, you have two types of hydrogens. And you would get A would be triplets, right? A would be triplet because it's attached to CH2. Um, so you get a triplet for A. And then for B, what would be B? This is a six hydrogen. And then for two, these two hydrogens, you would get also a septet, right? Seven. So when you have these, th this pattern, you can also use the integration line. With the integration line, that is the, vert the height of the vertical line is going to represent the ratio. This ratio is like a 3 to 1 or 6 to 2. And that shows that it's, you have six hydrogen that is coming from one type and two hydrogen from the other type. If you have the molar mass for this compound, you can easily identify the structure. So location for the peak, a splitting pattern, and then you get this integration line. That's another piece of information. Integration line shows how many of that type of hydrogen you have. Do you have any questions? I know the IR and NMR as much as needed for the uh, for the um, lecture is covered in lecture. There is one application that I have to cover it here because I promised you. You may not remember. It was the difference for ortho, meta, and para. Um, so if you have a uh, let's say um, chloro here, and then Chloro versus meta. Or para. The OH has no specific location really. OH has um, OH is um, anywhere between two to five, but the indication for OH is like that: is a sh is a broad peak and is very short peak. Uh, but for the other one, uh, for the the CH three, uh, I didn't I didn't really uh, when I was writing it down at the same time I said we don't have a specific location for this OH here is going to be anywhere between 2 to 5. So if you see that peak anywhere between 2 to 5, it shows the OH. I didn't put it up to scale for that one. You can put it on the other side to make it um, higher than the CH3O. Yes, you can do that. So I was just showing the shape of the OH. OK. Uh, the first step for you for this molecule is to find the type of hydrogens you have. And remember, this is the major mistakes that most of the students in organic to do. Like if they have, um, if you place a um, branch on the benzene ring, there is no hydrogen there. So you can't, you don't have a hydrogen where the CL is attached. So you, this compound has only, um, has only four hydrogen, four aromatic hydrogen. So the integration line, if represents four hydrogen, that means four hydrogen between seven and eight. That means your compound, your aromatic ring is di-substituted. If it shows five hydrogen in aromatic, five aromatic hydrogen, that means your compound, your aromatic ring is mono-substituted. So you can decide between a dimethyl benzene or ethyl benzene using the pattern. So let me finish this one first. So we have four hydrogens here. And the hydrogens that you have here, this hydrogen, if you call this one HA, this is going to be doublet or triplet or singlet. Mm. 
you're going to get a doublet for this one. And this is going to be the same. So you get a doublet for A. So you get a doublet. And for B, hydrogen B. For hydrogen B, it's going to be a triplet, right? You get a triplet, doublet and triplet. For meta substitutions, so we have an ortho, meta, and para. For meta substitutions, you have a hydrogen A. Your hydrogen A is going to be um, singlet. Your hydrogen B is going to be doublet. Hydrogen B is going to be doublet. And you have a hydrogen C here that is going to be triplet. So you get the you get singlet, doublet, and triplet. For ortho, you get a doublet and triplet. And if it's para, all these hydrogens are the same in this case, right? They are all the same. And because they are all the same, it's going to show one signal. And your signal is going to be doublet. If, and this is just if, if you had a different group attached to it, then you would have a hydrogen A and hydrogen B. And your hydrogen B also would have been a doublet. So if these hydrogens are different than the hydrogen A's, you get two doublets. But you don't get the triplet or you don't get the singlet when you have a para position. So that's how you can use for recognizing if you have an ortho, meta, or, or para. Uh, it's just explanation, just explanation, that the, the type of hydrogen, how many different types of hydrogens you would have. You can just go with that, yes. Okay. And that's for NMR, uh, chapter 18. Chapter 18, make sure to study chapter 18 over and over. If you have, for those of you who have an ebook, what page do you have the solubility chart? Can you tell me what page is that? Because for hard copy is 183. I just want to refer to the right page I'm talking about. Um, if you look at, if you just bring the solubility, uh, 181. Okay. So for the, uh, for solubility chart, um, please open the page to the solubility chart. And unfortunately, I couldn't bring that to my tablet to write on it. So I'm going to have to just talk about it. So when you have the compound, the first thing you want to do, you want to see if your molecule is water soluble or not. So if it dissolves in water, what does it mean a compound is soluble in water? Your compound is polar. Uh, what type of organic molecules can be soluble in water? Would hexanol dissolve in water? No, because hexanol, even though it's polar, but it has more than five carbons. So if your compound dissolves in water, that means it's a polar compound. It has, it has a polar functional group. So that could be, if it's soluble, it could be aldehyde. It could be ketone. Um, it could be carboxylic acid. It could be ester. Um, it could be amide, right? A compound that is, uh, that is, but less than, uh, less than five carbon. If it's more than five carbon, um, if it's five or more carbon, then it's going to be insoluble in, um, in water. Because when you're dealing with the, these compounds, they have nonpolar tail and a polar head. 
So when you have that polar head but non-polar tail is too long, it takes the priority. And if the if the the cutoff is five carbon, if it says you have uh, up to five carbon is going to be soluble, more than uh, five carbon is not going to be soluble. Basically, solubility decreases significantly at five carbon. Um, so the polar head with the non-polar tail. So if you have the non-polar tail small, then the polar head is going to take the priority and it would dissolve in water. So if the water dissolves, if the compound is water soluble, you cannot, uh, you, you, the, your conclusion would be that this is a polar compound and it has less than um, five carbon. If it's more than five carbon, it's not going to, uh, is not going to dissolve. Chlorides no, are not soluble, actually. Chlorides are not soluble in water. Um, the uh, methylene chloride that we use for our extraction, um, it's not soluble in water. Carbon tetrachloride is not soluble in water either. So chlorides not soluble in water. Um, it's just the, um, the, the salt of the chloride compounds, they are soluble in water. It says in the chart, it says that it's soluble, but I have to um, look into that and make it more specific that which chlorides are uh, are soluble. That's acid chlorides that are soluble. Chlorides are not soluble at all. Acid chlorides are different. Acid chlorides, they look this, CO, CL. Acid chlorides are soluble. I noticed that, it's okay. It's okay. Okay. So less than, you have the chart, and you may not like it now, but um, you get used to using this solubility chart for the experiment 19 too often, and you end up memorizing the chart. So if the compound is not soluble in water, what does it mean? What would be your next step? If it's not soluble in water, there's no conclusion really. It could be still, we, all we can say that is not polar compound with less than five carbon. Uh, if it's insoluble in water, then we are going to try sodium hydroxide. If we decide that we, if we test with the sodium hydroxide and if it dissolves in sodium hydroxide, it's either acid or phenol. If it dissolves. If it dissolves in the acid, in the uh, sodium hydroxide, is either carboxylic acid or is phenol. Now we cannot stop there because we want to be able to come up with the functional group. So we have to use a, another solvent that is going to discriminate between carboxylic acid and phenol. Uh, the, the other solvent is going to be sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate is weak base. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base. So if the base is a strong, your acid could be weak or it could be strong, it would dissolve both. If your base is weak, it's going to only dissolve the um, strong acid. It's not going to dissolve the weak acid. So. Phenol does not dissolve in sodium bicarbonate. Carboxylic acid dissolves in sodium bicarbonate. Because it's a weak base, this reaction may not be fast. So what I tell the students to look for when they are, uh, they are mixing the, the uh, unknown with this, to look for bubbles forming on top of the solution. If you see bubbles forming, that means these two compounds reacted, you end up with H2CO3. And because it's unstable, it decomposed to H2O plus CO2. And the CO2 gas is the one that it forms the bubbles. So we are looking for those bubbles when it's carboxylic acid with sodium bicarbonate. 
if the reaction is slow, you will still see that uh, those bubbles forming. But if it's uh, if the bubbles don't form um, and it doesn't disappear, that means you have a phenol. This reactions you have to keep the ratio properly. You don't want to use a small sample of solvent or large sample of solute because you can saturate your solution. And if it's saturated, you will get some of the solids precipitated or the liquid sample is going to form second layer because excess of the compound is not going to dissolve. So you have to make sure that the ratio you are using is proper. So if it's soluble in sodium hydroxide, we move to, to uh, sodium bicarbonate. If it's not soluble in sodium hydroxide, based on the chart, what should we do? We are going to use HCl. What type of compounds would dissolve in HCl? A compound that dissolves in HCl is going to be, in general, is going to be a basic compound, right? If the compound is basic, is going to dissolve in HCl is not actually dissolving. It's a term that is used commonly that is going to dissolve. Like for carboxylic acid and phenol, I'm going to have to write those reactions because you are responsible for them. Um, let's say for carboxylic acid, plus NaOH is going to form sodium salt you learned in general chemistry any compound that has sodium or any of the group 1a element is going to be soluble in water so this is not an exception so basically your carboxylic acid doesn't dissolve in sodium hydroxide solution what happens it reacts with sodium hydroxide it produces a uh, water soluble uh, water soluble product and this is this product is going to dissolve in water so this is an aq sodium hydroxide is made of 90% 95% or more water so this is an aq so that's this compound is going to dissolve in in water when it comes to phenol Same thing, it's a stronger acid than than water, uh, than alcohol because of the resonance, it can form resonance. So this is going to give phenoxide. And it's AQ. AQ, letter A and letter Q. And that stands for aqueous solution, solution that is going to a compound that dissolves in water. The uh, next you have we have the uh, what is negative? Is it negative? AQ meaning oh, Na is positive, oxygen is negative, yes. yes. So we have a positive negative charge because is is the salt of the phenol is not organic molecule. Now at this point it's a salt of the acid. So carboxylic acid with sodium hydroxide, I'm sorry, sodium bicarbonate. is going to react and it will give you very similarly O N A similar to the first reaction what happens with phenol and uh, phenol with sodium bicarbonate OH plus N A HCO3, no reaction. 
because this is a weak acid is not a weak base is not going to um, to dissolve the weak acid so with sodium bicarbonate carboxylic acid reacts but phenol does not react if you have amine with HCl I mean with the HCl I'm trying to squeeze it to the same page so because I want you to take a screenshot later um, I mean so you have NH2 plus HCl the product is going to be NH3 Cl minus plus and you remember all chlorides are soluble, right? Chlorides are all soluble with exceptions to uh, silver, mercury, and lead. Other chlorides are soluble. So this is the amine salt or chloride salt of this amine that is forming. So you have the product, and this is AQ, meaning that it's water soluble. All ionic compounds are soluble. So when they change the ionic compound, they are soluble in, in water. Okay, um, take a screenshot of this. We have one, two, three, four, and five reactions here. So you just don't say soluble, insoluble. You see what is actually happening that one dissolves or it doesn't dissolve so if the compound doesn't dissolve in um, if the compound dissolves in water would you test it with sodium hydroxide Do you have to test it? Do you, would you test it or not to see if it's acid or not? If it dissolves in water? Okay. If it dissolves in water, then there is no need to dissolve in sodium hydroxide because if you dissolve in sodium hydroxide, it's going to dissolve. But it's going to give you false po uh, false answer because then you would think that it's carboxylic acid. That could have been just a ketone with four carbon. Or ketone with three carbon then it dissolves in water and when you add sodium hydroxide it will dissolve but if it dissolves it dissolves in the water portion not the sodium hydroxide portion so if it dissolves in water you should not test with sodium hydroxide if your compound dissolves in sodium hydroxide then you don't have you should not test it with HCl so if it doesn't dissolve in sodium hydroxide, then you are testing with the HCl. If it dissolves in HCl, that means your compound could be amine, either primary, secondary, or tertiary. If it doesn't dissolve in water, if it doesn't dissolve in sodium hydroxide, it doesn't dissolve in uh, hydrochloric acid, then your compound is not carboxylic acid. Is not uh, phenol and is not amine. So far, those are the ones that you have discriminated. And even if it's, uh, unless if it dissolves in water, then you, you can only say that has less than four, um, five carbon. So it's four carbon or less. If it doesn't dissolve in uh, hydrochloric acid, then you are going to try the next solvent that you are using is going to be sulfuric acid if your compound dissolves in sulfuric acid if it's soluble in sulfuric acid that means your compound is either unsaturated or is a polar compound so if it dissolves or reacts with sulfuric acid, how do you know it's going to change color? It's going to actually, you will see color change and it will form one phase. Then it could be compound that contains oxygen, 
It could be alcohol, aldehyde, ester, uh, it could be ether or ketone or unsaturated carbon, uh, um, unsaturated hydrocarbon that could be alkene or alkyne. Um, if it doesn't dissolve in sulfuric acid, then your compound is going to be aromatic uh, or aliphatic hydrocarbon. So, or halogen derivatives, so chlorides is part of those and uh, is not going to dissolve in sulfuric acid. Now, what type of questions you would expect? Let's say you have two compounds. Okay, what solvent would you use based on the chart? What solvent would you use to determine to distinguish between the two, or to discriminate between the two, to say if your compound is A or is B? Water. Very good. And explain what happens if you add water. What's the point of difference? Okay, so all you should say that one, all it, what is sufficient is going to be that A would dissolve in water. Okay, A would dissolve in water, but B will not dissolve in water. So if you add water and it dissolves, that's the conclusion is that your compound is A and not B. So this it's like very similar to question that you because you were interested in type of question that's a very similar question to um, exam question so if you have a um, you have two compounds and you want to know if your compound is a so basically two compounds is given to you and you want to discriminate between or distinguish what type of solvent you would use um, to distinguish between A and B here. And how does uh, NaOH is going to help us? What will happen if you add NaOH? Or which one dissolves, which one doesn't dissolve, basically? NaOH would dissolve B. B is soluble in NaOH, and A is not soluble in NaOH. Any other answer? Can you use HCl? If you use HCl, then A would dissolve in HCl, B will not dissolve in HCl. So either one of them, it would be um, correct answer. Um, can you give me an example of alcohol that is not soluble in water? Hexanol doesn't dissolve in alcohol. How would you distinguish between these two? Question one was water. Water would dissolve A. For three, what would you use for question three? 
you would add sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate would react with B and is not going to react with A. So we can, we can use the solubility chart to narrow down our functional groups. So if you, find, if you have a compound that it did not dissolve in sodium hydroxide or HCl, but it did dissolve in um, sulfuric acid. What is the possible functional group for that? What are the possible functional groups for your unknown? Your compound did not dissolve in uh, sodium hydroxide, did not dissolve in HCl, but it did dissolve in sulfuric acid. Uh, sulfuric acid doesn't need a strong base uh, to, um, to dissolve it. Sulfuric acid is actually very strong. If it dissolves in sulfuric acid, that means that your compound has some sort of polarity, actually. So it could be anything that contains oxygen with more than 5 carbon. Um, because it didn't dissolve in water already, it didn't dissolve in, uh, in sodium hydroxide or HCl. That means that has is polar and has more than five carbon, so it's a high molecular weight compound. If you look at the chart, you could see it's soluble in H2SO4. So that's the last group. That would be group Z in the chart. And the group Z, it could be alcohol, it could be aldehyde, it could be ester, ether, ketone, unsaturated hydrocarbon. Any of those could be the answer. Okay. Experiment. Any questions about the chart, solubility chart? Questions? No questions? Yes. You may type your question, please. Okay, that means if your compound contains sulfur or nitrogen with the elemental analysis, uh, and the compounds that we are working actually for the, for this lab this semester, we are going to eliminate those compounds. I didn't use it last semester either. So, if the compound contains nitrogen. Um, N and S, it's, you said? Yes, if N is present, if the compound does not have nitrogen or it doesn't have sulfur, that's what it means. Yes, if it doesn't have sulfur or nitrogen. Okay, you still have your solubility chart open, right? Your compound did not dissolve in uh, in water, sodium hydroxide, HCl, but dissolved in H2SO4. Your compound could be alcohol, it could be aldehyde. It could be ketone.
what is my next step? What should I do? What would be the next logical step? So which one is it? So it could be one of these three. Let's say it could be one of these three. What should be my next step? Because based on solubility chart, you are going to discriminate. This is like a primary test for an unknown. And then you discriminate other functional groups. You say it could be either alcohol, aldehyde, or ketone. What would be the next logical step? What should I do? IR NMR is not going to be option for wet chemical analysis, though. For this, we're just learning based on functional groups. Uh, we have to test with uh, chemicals. We already tested an AOH and it was negative. So this X here means that it, it did not dissolve in sodium hydroxide. What would be next step? We're trying to go from this step. So it's either alcohol, aldehyde, or ketone. You don't have to give me a specific reagent. You just tell me a an option, like a move. What should we do? What's the next logical step? What should we do to discriminate against those? Because they are under the same group in the solubility chart. Test with reducing agent. OK. If I test with reducing agent, uh, ketone would go to secondary alcohol, and aldehyde would go to primary alcohol, and this may not be reduced. Okay. If I test with, uh, with uh, you are going to learn this, but I just want to make sure, I want, just want to build up the idea to make sure that you understand how uh, the classification test is uh, designed and is needed. So first you have to come up with like limited number of functional group using the solubility chart. Then from solubility chart, after you're done with that, with the narrowing down your, your um, choices, then you use classification tests. There is a test called seric nitrate test. And the seric nitrate test is specific for alcohol. Now, if your uh, compound with the alcohol with the seric ammonium nitrate, you mix any unknown with that reagent, it's going to show negative test except if it's alcohol. So if it gives like bright color, like a dark color of yellow or dark orange color or red color, um, then we know that is alcohol. If it's negative, that means it's not alcohol, then it's going to be either aldehyde or ketone. If it's alcohol, then we are going to move with the testing with alcohol to see as primary, secondary, tertiary, and others. But if we know it's not alcohol, then we have to find another reagent that is going to um, discriminate between aldehyde and ketone. Can you find that, that reagent from classification test? I have page 186. Um, what test do you have? What page number do you have? So to confirm you have, OK, to confirm you have uh, either aldehyde or ketone, you can use. Um, 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine, so DP and H. So you can use the that the first test under aldehydes or ketones. The first one A is going to give positive for both of them. But if you use toluene reagent, toluene reagent is going to only react with aldehyde and not with ketone because this can be oxidized if you oxidize it it can go to carboxylic acid but ketone if you oxidize it it would be no reaction so with the toluene reagent or the shift reagent or chronic acid all of them the ketone is going to be no reaction but aldehyde is going to react because aldehyde has a hydrogen attached to carbonyl group 
it can be oxidized further, a ketone is going to stop here, is not going to oxidize further. It can do other reactions, but no oxidation. You can do reduction. A reduction basically is adding hydrogens. Oxidation is removing hydrogen. If there is no hydrogen here, you cannot add the ketone uh, carbon. There is no way that you can remove hydrogen because there is no hydrogen. Just like tertiary alcohols, there is no hydrogen in the carbon for tertiary alcohol. Um, functional group, so you cannot oxidize it. That's why tertiary alcohols do not oxidize, just like ketone. So you are using classification tests to narrow down and to know the exact, if you have more than one choice, then you know which one is it. Now, if you know you have ketone, but is it going to be pentanone, octanone, hexanone, what type of ketone it is. For that, you find the, you go back to physical property. You measure the melting point or boiling point if it's liquid, melting point for solid, then you can match with the exact name. And for that, you do have a page number. You have a table for aldehydes and ketones um, that starts on page 215. You have one that is for aldehydes and ketones. Uh, the first page, it's li for liquids. And then you go to, you have another table also. You start with carboxylic acid in page, page 225 for me. For you, it starts with page 223. And then uh, you have carboxylic acid that are solid or liquid. Then you have aldehydes and ketones. Aldehydes, then ketones. So you have the melting point, you have the... So I'm just going to talk about one of those tables. Pick one table, and then we talk about it, and we leave the rest for later. OK. I'm going to pick the page number 230 for ebook, 232 for for the um, 232 for the hard copy. Okay. What happens if your compound, liquid, I was hoping for solid compound, but liquid is fine. Okay. Page 232 or page 230? You find out for sure your compound is ketone. And you measure the boiling point. You find the boiling point to be 217. What would be the product based on that table? Bring the table, please look at the table. You find the boiling point for your ketone, and you find the 217. Can you write what is the unknown? But what about if your thermometer is, uh, it has some error, is not calibrated? Uh, remember experiment one? Experiment 12 that you did this semester, first experiment. The boiling point, they were like two, three, four degree difference in the boiling point. Uh, did you rely on the boiling point? And if you find a 216, would you be able to say that is the methyl? Uh, or to towel ketone. Probably not, right? So you cannot depend. Sometimes the boiling point <coughs> or melting point is too close to other possible compounds. You have more than one possible compound. Then you have to go further further, one extra step, then you have to derivatize it. 
if you use the the DNP here to for dinitrophenylhydrazone, which is the after the boiling point, you have oxime, semicarbazone, phenylhydrazone, and then the 2,4-dinitro. If you find the 2,4-dinitro, phenylhydrazine, you prepare the 2,4-dinitro. Basically, it's like a few drops of the reagent, DNP reagent. You add to your ketone, you get the solid compound. And then that solid compound that you have, you measure the melting point, just like the, the acid that you got for your experiment 12. If the melting point is close to 159, then it's going to be the first compound. If it's close to 191, it's going to be the second compound. So if you have the boiling point and the melting point of the derivative, both of them, you can identify your unknown. So it takes like multi-steps. Questions? Okay, starting next lab, you are going to put on your detective pad and try to identify compounds based on their, based on the uh, 230, page 230 in the ebook. Uh, based on the physical property, based on solubility chart, based on the uh, melting point and uh, solubility chart. You can narrow down the uh, narrow down the uh, functional groups, and then when you have two or three possible uh, functional group, then you can um, then you would uh, then you would do the classification test. Based on classification test, you come up with one functional group. So you know you have aldehyde, ketone, carboxylic acid, or what? And from there, you are going to, uh, you are going to, if needed, you would find the derivative of that compound, and you find your unknown. But sometimes it's easier to say to reset than is done, and I understand that part. So what's going to happen is that I'm going to first. Uh, lets you practice with the uh, known sample. So we already know next lab we are working only with alcohols and uh, hydrocarbons. Um, the class following that we are only working for aldehydes and ketones. So we are practicing. And when you are done with the practicing, then, uh, then we are going to work on the, with the unknown. And we have the unknown, and then you are going to find out what is the what's the unknown. Now, a couple of questions: Do you have to copy the temperature charts? No, there are too many of them. Now you have the reference. That's why it's needed for you to have a lab manual. And the lab manual this semester, actually, the publisher was nice enough that when I requested, like within the very short notice, they actually uh, they actually. 230, page 230, to recap. That, that, that temperature that we were talking about, that was page 230. And uh, we were just using that as an example. Example of a ketone that would melt or boil at 216 or 217. So because the boiling point were very close, we couldn't recognize what compound it is. And we had to do derivative of the 2,4-dinitro phenylhydrazine derivative. And based on that, we can find the identity for the compound. So we have three class for practicing with the known samples. And then you do write the lab reports for those. Uh, then we are working with the unknown. So we have a total of five more experiments. Experiment day. Okay. Questions for me? No questions? 
the screenshot, please submit it where you have the lab notebook for this. Notebook, which number for 17 and 18? Either one. There is one. Yes, it's a 17 plus 18. Okay, I'm going to stop the... Uh, yes, you have submitted already. I'm just saying that you can include the, uh, the screenshot that you took today into the same folder because it allows multiple submissions. Yes, add another submissions to it, yes. Perfect. You're welcome. Okay, I'm going to stop recording and then I call the uh, for attendance and after the attendance then I can answer more questions. I'm going to 